Critical thinking required and the dumbest bill in America. This is Mark Fisher with Mark of the Millennials and the Millennial. Joining me today is Garrick Ross. Of course. Welcome back. Of course. Oh boy, it's a fait accompli that Garrick Ross is going to be here uh-huh. <laughs> during the quarantine. And of course, Christopher Hopkins, our assistant producer, and Adam Katura, our producer. The podcast is called Critical Thinking Required, and of course, the dumbest bill in America. And why is it called Critical Thinking is Required? Because we think you can use your own judgment to determine whether you want to remain quarantined, whether you want to go back to work, whether you want to be safer when you go outside or inside other places. Uh, basically, it's, it's up to you. Uh, that's right? tough, Mark. I think critical thinking is a skill lacking in society lately. But Apparently, that- it is. And we're going to prove that this podcast yeah. because we have all different kinds of politicians with scare tactics, as well as businessmen and women who are responding in different ways. Even a sports figure decided to violate the quarantine, which I think is terrific. Uh, and then, of course, the governor went after him. But first up, we have David Portnoy. He's the founder of Barstool Perez. Sports. Barstool Sports. It's the definitely the cutting edge, cutting edge uh, sports channel, if you will, yeah. whereby they just make fun of um, all kinds of things, and it's completely and utterly politically correct, right? No, absolutely not. It is totally impolitically correct, and that's what's beautiful about it. It is people being brutally honest about, you know, general topics and other things. You know, it is, honestly, though, Barstool, I think, has kind of revolutionized the way that we look at a lot of different things in the sports world. I mean, the popularity of sports gambling, Barstool has had a lot to do with and, no doubt. you know, continues to push. They have great podcasts, if anybody, like, is looking for interesting sports podcasts to watch. I'd they allow you to post just about anything, and yeah. then they, they show it. I mean, that's pretty much uncensored. Yeah, uncensored, unfiltered. It is honest opinions about honest topics. And look. If you complain about something because you you were offended or you're triggered they don't by care. something, they don't care. They do not care. And look, they've gotten in trouble. They've done a lot of things that, like, you know, they've, they've definitely walked a lot of fine lines, and they've walked past some lines, like, blatantly. But, you know, it's... It's refreshing that there are people and shows out there and like things I think that this show tries to do. And that's just, you know, be honest, have an honest conversation and not, you know, try to give, you know, these like politically correct and condensed thoughts. And laugh at yourself from time to time. Have some humility. It's okay to laugh at yourself. Laugh at yourself a little bit. So Dave Portnoy, the founder of Barstool Sports, uh, said, quote, when did flattening the curve turn into finding a cure? That is to say, you know, we were quarantining because we wanted to flatten the curve. We didn't want the hospitals to be overwhelmed. Yeah. That made perfect sense. But now we're hearing from some governors and some politicians saying, well, now that we've flattened the curve, we need to find a cure before you can actually go back to work or go back to your normal life. And he's like, what? And that's so such have, an open-ended solution. It's not viable. It's not. It's exactly right. Um, And we have two clips on this. And here is the first of two clips with David Portnoy. Here it is. When did this become flatten the curve, flatten the curve, flatten the curve to we have to find a cure or everyone's going to die? Like Fauci. Seems like a nice enough dude. I've always been like, oh, no agenda. Looks like he could be maybe the grandfather in Wedding Crashers. (laughs) Gets in front of the Senate. He's like, we reopen the country too quick. Everyone's dead. Where'd that come from? And the L.A. mayor. We're not open in the city till we find a cure? What? Find a cure? Who says we're gonna find a cure? We haven't found a cure to cancer. It took AIDS 20 years or whatever. Do we even have a cure? So the economy just shut down? All we've heard forever, flatten the curve, flatten the curve, make sure there's hospital beds, we're there. Now all of a sudden it's like a 180. This is like taking a cross country flight, six hours, they tell you flight six hours. Five hours and a half go by. They get on the intercom like, oh, just kidding. We have another 10 hours. You can't do that. <laughs> People are mentally preparing. We're doing what you ask. <laughs> I love that. I love that example, you know? So true, though. <laughs> it's like you're on a flight that's six hours. You're going from East Coast to West Coast. You're told it's six hours. You're in five and a half hours into it thinking you're going to be landing soon. And they say you got another 10 hours. It turns out you've just been circling LaGuardia all day. <laughs> Which, which which does happen, by the way. <laughs> uh, LaGuardia or Kennedy or Newark, for that imagine. Oh, you know, God, those Northeast state. airports. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry for anybody who's ever had to fly through there. <laughs> so flattening the curve, I mean, which always made sense. Want to make sure the podcast listeners understand what we're saying. Yeah, flattening you have to be able to treat everybody. We want to be able to give everybody 
high quality health care unless you lived in New York or Pennsylvania or other states and you happen to be in a nursing home, in which case those governors Your decide SOL. to yeah, those those governors decide to decided to just throw you aside and you know you were disposable, which is and disgusting. That's tragic, yeah. It is tragic. But Portnoy makes a great point because yeah. he's, he's just like, why can't we just make our own minds? Um, yeah. Why can't we do what we want to do, provided that we're safe about it? And his perspective is important. I mean, that if you can go watch the whole 10-minute video in your own time, he makes a lot of great points all over the place, especially from a business perspective. And as you know, somebody who's dealt a lot with business owners who are struggling right now, his perspective is so fresh and, and honest because he's saying, you know, we, we need at least a fighting chance. Like businesses are going out, uh, going out of business and they likely won't come back. And the government is just saying, oh, well now we need a cure, but it's not viable. Like let us go to work. Let us try to save ourselves before, you know, Let's we don't have anything to go, anything to come back to. Exactly. So we have a second clip from David Portnoy and it's, it's basically, hey, you know, if you stay at home, if you're afraid, take responsibility. Yeah. It's a great clip. Here it is. If you're that scared still of Corona, stay inside. The beds are open. It doesn't kill every. I get it. It's not a great option. There are no great options. But you can't just decimate the entire economy. How the f is that going to work? We're staying inside till there's a cure? When did that become the game? Who said we're getting the cure? That's not a guarantee. So we're just done as humans? Get the hell out of here. There's risk. We're Americans. You have to take risk. If people want to go out, they can go out. If they want to stay in, they stay in. So there you go. The podcast is called Critical Thinking Required. Yeah. Literally, that is what David Portnoy is saying. You have to be a critical thinker. Make up your own mind as to whether you want to go back to work. And if you do, go back to work. Yeah. If you don't want to go back to work because you're terrified, don't go back to work. Yeah. Take responsibility for the decision Take that you make. Take personal responsibility. Take personal responsibility. It's your judgment. Use your own judgment. Because yeah. guess what? We're adults. We get to make our own judgments. We yeah. get to do, especially now that we see the really incredibly low death rate. I'm not saying that, you know, that you can't die from this. We're not saying that. And with, here's what upsets me, Garrick. Um, and I hope, hopefully you see this as a millennial. I see this as a boomer. I get so tired of having this conversation with people, especially on the left. And they're like, oh, so you want to see more people die. That's not the choice that we're, we're putting yeah. out there. We're saying, make up your mind. You don't have to go yeah. back if you don't want to. Yeah, this isn't like, uh, nobody is compulsing you to do anything you don't want to do. If you want to stay home and collect unemployment, you can do that. And, and look, is there barriers for unemployment? Sure, but we can, you know, that's a whole other topic. But a lot of these businesses, it is the end of the line. The PPP is wearing out. State, state funding is not covering the difference. Yes. It is either go back to work and, and start supporting yourselves or you're going to have a structural issue with the economy that isn't going to be readily fixable in the next you know, decade. That's exactly right. And and even Mnuchin brought that up, and we'll go that to that in a couple minutes. But the fact of the matter is, is David Portnoy, you're right, during that 10-minute or so video, he said, look, I started this company from scratch. Yeah. And he said, if I had to remain closed longer and I went out of business, he said, I'm not sure I would want to live. Yeah. He's, you know, and now this is his, his decision. Life. It's been his life. This is his decision. This is what he's deciding to do. And by the way, we're not suggesting that if you open your company back up because you're the owner of a company that you say to your employees, you must show up to work. Um, look, I think in this particular pandemic age, if you will, your employees, if they don't want to come to work, they don't have to. The circumstances are unique for every person. Take some time, some critical thinking, evaluate your personal circumstances. If you are 78 and have a bunch of morbidities, you know, which is, you know, any kind of underlying health condition, you probably shouldn't be going out. You know, your grandparents probably shouldn't be going out. But if you're a healthy young individual who who is absolutely has nothing to stress about, go to work. You know, a case in point, a friend of mine uh, who was an elected official in Maryland, wrote an op-ed in the Baltimore Sun, and, he, and his op-ed was about, hey, look, it's time to go back to work. And, yes. and he had some really great points about it, and he had facts, and he's actually a very good writer, and he's very fact-based when he writes and does a lot of research. And so the article it gets posted on social media, and the first thing that happened was uh, a mom posts on there, oh, so you want to see more children die? And he's like, with all due respect, no children have died in the entire state from COVID-19, she goes, well, one just died today. Well, there was an article that was out the same day, yeah. which was just a couple of days ago, and it said that it was the first reported case 
uh, either first or second reported case of a child having uh, succumbed to COVID-19. But when you actually read the article, it wasn't entirely clear right. that they could do that. Look, we don't want anyone to die no, from anything, not. right? But his point was, do you shut down an entire school system um, based on this? And my point is, my point is that we have people that are losing their jobs, they're losing, losing their livelihoods. Many are going to lose their homes. Uh, many are going to lose their apartments. And David Portno Portnoy just brought to bear because he is a cultural figure with yeah. you guys, you millennials. millennials. boomers alike. I think he's one of those people who kind of bridges the, yeah, the gap Yeah, he does there. bridge the gap. A lot of gap. people really like it, think it's refreshing. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned the, the, uh, the argument that you frequently hear and that it's like we're – doing either the economy or we're doing mass death. And and I and I hate the the positions there as like it's not either mutually or. exclusive and you <laughs> gotta right. pick one or the other. And it's and I also find it to be like an intellectually dishonest argument that, you know, if we do open up the economy it's gonna be mass deaths and you know that because we want the economy to open, we want kids to die or things like or that. Or that you specifically want people to die because you want to go back to work. Yeah, it's not and that's it's not fair. People are ascribing motives. By the way, if you're out there listening and you're and you're one of those people that's ascribing motives to others who actually want to go back to work and save their small businesses or they want to save their family farm or they want to save their home. You know what? I can, I'd like to tell you where to go because it's not your decision to tell me how I live my life, okay? Yeah. Do I have a responsibility of wearing a mask when I go yes. uh, inside of places? Yes, I do. Do yes. I have a responsibility of social distancing? Yes, yes, I do. Do I have a responsibility of washing my hands? Oh, by the way, all you people, you know who you are who went to the bathroom and never washed your hands yeah. when you left the bathroom. Let's, let's keep making washing our hands cool yeah. after this is all <laughs> exactly. over. A lot of you were like, whoa. Washing hands is like this like Marvel concept. Like we just reinvented the wheel here. It's like, like that dude that ran out of the uh, <laughs> ran out of the stall, right? <laughs> and you know that because you walked in the bathroom and it was like awful in there when you walked and in. And he just walks right out. Like an out. animal died and he walks right out, touches the door handle and everything, and disgusting. then goes and eats dinner in the oh, restaurant. That's terrible. I mean, it's terrible. disgusting. So speaking of the fact that you should take personal responsibility and speaking of the fact that of how people, Garrick, are politicizing this pandemic, Treasury, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, Steve Mnuchin, and Fed Chairman Jerome Powell went to Capitol Hill. Yes. And they testified based on the economy and the risks to the economy by keeping it locked down. Important to note that they are financial people with business backgrounds and they deal primarily in economics and are not health experts. That's exactly right. And so Sherrod, Senator Sherrod Brown, he's a Democrat from Ohio, he, his job, of course, as well as the other members of the committee, are to ascertain information, would be to ascertain information from Powell and, and from Mnuchin. critical questions. Critical questions about what are the risks to the economy. And one, one risk, by the way, is would we go into a Great Depression, in which case it's really bad for America. I think our health. unemployment rate's already higher than at the peak of the, uh, the Great Depression. I haven't seen the latest unemployment rate, so I'm not sure about that. But the fact of the matter is, is Sherrod Brown had that opportunity. And we have a clip on this. Listen to, he has the an question. opportunity to really get important information. And listen to what he decides Tax. to spend his time on to ask. Here is the clip. So how many, how many workers should give their lives to increase our GDP by half a percent? That you're, that you're pushing people back into the workplace. You, there's been no national program to provide worker safety. The president says reopen slaughterhouses, nothing about slowing the line down, nothing about getting protective equipment. Is, is, is How many workers should give their lives to increase the GDP or the Dow Jones by 1,000 points? You know workers should give their lives to do that, Mr. Senator, and I think your characterization is unfair. We have provided enormous amounts of equipment. We've worked with the governors. We've done a terrific job. So Senator Sherrod Brown decides to spend his time attacking Mnuchin and Powell by saying, how many more people have to die by going back to work because you want to make the economy stronger and that's all that you care about? And there you go. That's why we're saying critical There's thinking matters. There's that false matters. dichotomy. It's you know? a false it's dichotomy. It's the economy or deaths. And, and I think Steve Mnuchin had a great answer there, especially pertaining to working with the governors. Because if you look at it, the crux of um, Sherrod Brown's argument is that in order to ensure the livelihoods of people, um, there needs to be a national strategy. Um, 
And that's not, that's not applicable because you have 50 unique states with 50 unique circumstances and uh, varying degrees of, of economy there. And don't forget that in, inside each state, you also have rural areas and urban yep, areas, yep. areas. And so, so I think, you know, Steve Mnuchin's point is, is, you know, we're working with the governors. You know, the solution for Florida is not going to be the same as the solution for California. And for somebody like Sherrod Brown, who, who should take a look at Ohio, who is doing its own unique set of circumstances that is different from even its neighboring states like Indiana or Illinois. Illinois, um, you know, I, I don't think it's fair for him to be levying for some national, you know, program to put workers back together as if somehow, you know, something that Trump says in Washington is going to apply equally to every state. And so Sherrod Brown, of course, was advocating that we must have a lockdown until we have a cure, until un, we have a un, vaccine. Unfeasible. And meanwhile, of course, Steve Mnuchin is saying, look, we risk permanent damage to the economy if lockdowns continue. Now, when someone like Steve Mnuchin, who's a numbers guy, says permanent damage, what he means, ladies and gentlemen, is a Great Depression. Yeah. We can't have a Great Depression. Decades long recession. Many more will die from a Great Depression uh, than will die from this particular pandemic. Yeah. And it's a terrible choice to have to make, but here's the thing, here's what we keep saying, the millennial Garrick and I, we keep saying the same thing, which is, don't go back to work if you're one of those people that doesn't want to go back to work because you're fearful. Yeah, and you know what? It's easy for, for people like Sherrod Brown and a lot of, and I'm coming at you boomers a little hard here, but <laughs> it's easy for a lot the of these boomer people. boomer remover. <laughs> it's easy for a lot of these people to sit and call for something like, you know, a lockdown for an indefinite period of time for something that you might not have to physically deal with the consequences of. A yes. lot of people are already out of the workforce that are calling for a lot of these things or in unique privileged positions. What you're gonna do is you're gonna stratify, stratify my generation who is gonna be left to pick up the pieces and oh, try I, to make a place in the world where there is no opportunity. And your children. And our children's children. Yes. Um, it's gonna be, it, it's not fair. You it, know? It, absolutely not. So get this, Elon Musk and Ivanka Trump have a moment on Twitter. They have a moment on Trevor. Twitter. So e Elon Musk, of course, the founder of Tesla, and Ivanka Trump, the president of the United States' wife, their moment is that Elon Musk decides to, he decides he wants to open up his factory to make more Teslas uh, and calls his employees back to work. His employees, indeed, for the most part, do want to come back to work. They started back to work. Meanwhile, the governor of California initially threatened that he would... Uh, and the county, I think, of Alameda, they threatened yeah. to basically shut him down. They decided not to. Shut him down and arrest him. And so what does he post out there? Elon Musk posts, uh, uh, he tweets, rather, and he puts, uh, take the red pill, like take from the, the Matrix, pill. right? <laughs> and, of course, that refers to the idea that you were stuck in this government-controlled or AI-controlled yeah. computer situation where machines control all things and people are the batteries that that make the machines move forward and if you take the red pill you can escape all of that rather than having this leviathan of government completely wrapped around you telling you what you can and can't do yeah and for anybody who doesn't know what the matrix is it's that cool movie where the guy dodges the bullets and does all the cool acrobats you, you know which one i'm talking about <laughs> uh also it's got um uh, what's his name from john wick i can't think of it what's well, keanu, keanu reeves keanu and, reeves yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. he That's plays it. neo yeah neo yeah. yeah so he's the he's the protagonist so Ivanka Trump, of course, tweets back to Elon Musk, and she says, taken, as if she had taken the, the red pill, you know? Yeah. No doubt that the Trumps are red pill takers because they're not buying no a big government <laughs> yeah. and of ever controlling government. So if you remember The Matrix, uh, it's a pretty extraordinary movie. Uh, we have uh, two clips on this, uh, just short clips, but they're pretty awesome because it deals with, again, the Leviathan of government. And, of course, it's a metaphor for what happens to us if we rely too much on machines and machine technology and AI and when it takes over and runs us rather than us run it. Just the same thing we're seeing kind of now where we have governors and we have county executives and we have other politicians at the state and federal level who are deciding every aspect of our lives, which we'll talk about more shortly. Here's the first of two clips. Here it is. The Matrix is everywhere. <laughs> it is all around us. It's everywhere. Even now, in this very room, you can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. You can't go to church. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> that you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage. You are born sheep. into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. 
a prison for your mind. Yes, there you go. So deep, so intellectual. <laughs> you are a slave. That uh, movie just really draws you in, though. When you watch that movie, it draws you in from beginning to end. It was so cool for, me, for I like sci-fi. Oh, yeah, it was a really cool early 2000 sci-fi movie. So take the red pill. You have two choices. You take the red pill or you take the blue pill, right? Explain that. Yeah, so take the red pill, wake up, realize what's going on in the world, or, you know, take the blue pill and continue to be a sheep being shepherded around by people in government. <laughs> and who, what does Neo take in the movie? Oh, he takes the red pill. Takes the red pill. And that's what Elon Musk is talking about. I'm not going to go where the herd goes, Elon Musk is saying, and Ivanka Trump saying, I'm going to go take the road less traveled. And we have a really short clip on that. And here it is. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. That's just awesome. That's just so awesome. It's so Elon Musk, how too, right? How deep the rabbit hole goes. <laughs> so he apparently gave all of his employees the red pill, and it wasn't hydroxychloroquine like the president's taking either. So it was... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> they went down the they went down the rabbit hole, and yeah. now they're back at work because people can make up their own minds, which is really what he's saying. Yeah. Right now, of course, we're we're paraphrasing the movie, but the fact of the matter is, if you've seen the movie, it's certainly relatable now more than ever. Thoughts? Yeah. You want to hear you want to hear the red pill story right now? Yeah. Look at James Clyburn's comments in the immediate a- aftermath of the realization of how bad. COVID-19 was going to be. So if anybody doesn't know, James Clyburn is the, currently the majority whip in the House of Representatives. Yes, He's a right. high-ranking Democrat. And his initial thoughts were not, you know, what can we do to stop the, the pandemic and, you know, how can we make people's lives better in light of all the circumstances? It was, how can I use the pandemic to socially engineer the country in a way that best fits my, you know, my progressive agenda? That's and, right. And that is, that is the red pill. Yes. Yeah. Or or in his case, he wants everybody to take the blue pill. He wants pill. everybody to take the blue pill. The blue pill. No. So that if they take the blue pill, they're under control of the matrix, which is the matrix that he's trying to build to control everybody, which the Democrats have been doing for generations, certainly since the New Deal, obviously. So get this, podcast listeners. Do you need to be told how to play tennis in a pandemic? So podcast listeners, let me repeat this again. Oh, Do you need the government to explain to you how you can safely play tennis on a tennis court, do you need the government to tell you? Well, in Nassau County, New York, so Nassau County is on Long Island, New York. Yes. And uh, just so you know, for full disclosure, my wife was uh, basically raised on Nassau County, New York. It's a very populated county on Long Island. And County Executive Laura Curran decided to have a press conference She's the county executive of Nassau County. It's a county of well over a million people. I mean, there's a lot of people that live there. Um, And she decided that she needed a press conference to explain to people during a pandemic, now that she was opening up the tennis courts, what is the best way and how is the best way to play tennis with your partner? Oh, boy. So she starts the press conference, and it goes very badly. Um, badly in terms of really funny, uh, at least for us here at Mark and the Millennials. Um, To her credit, she even starts to laugh, and certainly everybody watching starts to laugh. Talking about balls is always a touchy subject, (laughs) Mark. (laughs) But can I ask you something? Yes. Do we really need the government in this age to tell us how to safely play tennis? I mean, it it is the ultimate non-contact sport. It's the ultimate social distancing sport. You stand about 30 feet apart and you start hitting balls back and forth. But she's concerned that if you're playing tennis with a partner, that you're sharing the same, you know, tennis balls with the partner and that you might touch the same tennis balls that the partner is touching that you're playing against or your opponent is touching. Or or there's people two courts over and now you're you're swapping balls with each other. Yeah, so, and of course, you know, we're talking about all of this uh, idea of being being personally responsible for your own life and deciding, you know, how often to wash your hands and so forth. Just being, I am using not, common sense. I am not a health expert, Mark, but I would say that the chances of ball-to-ball transmission from coronavirus are minimal. I, I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to touch that comment at all. So we actually have, <laughs> we 
we actually have a we have a clip from Nassau County Executive Laura Curran explaining how best to safely play tennis. And here is the clip. Every player, unless they're from the same same household, has to bring their own tennis balls so that you don't touch other people's tennis balls. Um, with your hands. You can kick their balls, but you can't <laughs> touch them. I'm gonna blush, sorry. Um, of course, if you're, pl if you're playing with someone in your household, you can touch those tennis balls. Uh, to, avoid <laughs> to avoid confusion between whose balls are whose, you can use a marker, like a Sharpie, to mark out to put an X or put someone's initials on them. Yes, yes, so. How do you use track of whose balls are whose, man? <laughs> you, should, you should mark your balls to make sure that you only are using and touching your balls and not touching oh. the balls marked by your opponent. Oh, boy. And in addition to that, you should not, you know, if you want to pass a ball to someone, you should kick you should kick their ball to them. Oh. Um, you know, so it's okay to kick their balls, but you shouldn't really pick up their balls. That is an excellent speech. Yeah. <laughs> excellent. So. You know, it is the levity that this, this country needs at just, a moment like this. I, can you imagine? I just want a podcasters to, podcaster, podcast listeners, please ask me or please tell me, do you really need someone do, in government to properly explain to you how to play tennis safely in a pandemic. I mean, this is, I've never heard anything so ridiculous, but also at the same time, so funny. Oh my God. And I mean, she basically trashed herself, her entire reputation by thinking that we need government. It's the nanny state of telling uh, us. <laughs> Mark, sometimes I, I, I find myself and I almost believe that there's some chance the government could do some giant takeover, but then but then you hear somebody like this talk and you're like, no, there's no way. There's no way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I just want everybody, podcast listeners, be careful. When, when in Nassau County, the county executive... Keep track of your balls. <laughs> yes, keep track of your balls and make sure they're properly marked. <laughs> so <laughs> next up, Pennsylvania governor is not happy, the Pennsylvania governor is not happy that the quarterback, Ben Roethlisberger of the Steelers went for a haircut during the pandemic. So Ben Roethlisberger, of course, was injured, and um, he apparently had this pact whereby he was not going to shave or cut his hair until he was well enough to start playing for or at any, least For anybody not familiar again. with Ben Roethlisberger, also, it's even more funny because yeah, for a quarterback, you know, one of the supposedly the most athletic positions on the football field, he's, he's a bigger guy. He's huge, yes. Well, he's a little heavy set. Yes. For, for a quarterback, and so he kind of just looked like a caveman. And he looked like a caveman, like a grizzly bear kind of guy living in, you know, outback country or certainly in Alaska. That's what he looked like. Mm -hmm. And uh, so during his daily briefing Tuesday, Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf criticized Roethlisberger's recent trip to Norman's Cutting Edge Barbershop in Sawicki, Pennsylvania. Must be an Eagles fan. Because <laughs> uh, Roethlisberger went to get his hair cut and his beard trimmed uh, following a workout that he did with the Pittsburgh Steelers teammates because Roth Roethlisberger is now healthy enough to do so. But the governor of Pennsylvania, Governor Tom Wolf, was very upset about this because Tom Wolf hadn't opened up and okayed barbershop He's one of like the most uptight governors in this right now. He, he seems like, I'm sorry, he seems like a real sissy governor anyway. I mean, I know that's probably not politically correct, but he just seems like one of those guys, I'm afraid for everybody. Okay, I know that's probably your role as governor, but you know what your role is also to say? You can go to anywhere you want to go if you're willing to take the risk, and as long as you take the proper precautions when you take that and risk. I'm going to keep referencing it. The New York study done on New York transmissible cases, the highest in the country, 70% of those cases were done through people living in the same cohabitated space. Your risk when you go out in public is probably far less than sitting at home with somebody. Absolutely. And the Steelers and Roethlisberger posted a 38-second video uh, of the quarterback throwing to his teammates, marking a major milestone in his recovery from his September elbow surgery. But after showing Roethlisberger throwing to wide receiver Juju Smith and James Conner, the video cut to the freshly shorn cornerback in a barber's chair getting his beard trimmed. So there was video proof of him doing this, which is why the Pennsylvania governor just went crazy oh, about man. this. Um, but here's the funniest thing. Um, he, he decided, Roethlisberger decided to speak through his attorney, feeling like the Pennsylvania governor might arrest him or something. We have a clip on this, and uh, here is the clip. I don't do the most, but I do a lot. I'ma make a toast, cause we still alive. 
No big. I feel like Pac. I shoot a shot. I'm coming in. He's back. Stay tuned. So at the very end, you see Roethlisberger. He's getting his hair cut and his beard trimmed. And he looks all quaffed, right? And of course, he's got a big smile on his face. And since there is still a stay-at-home order, and at the same time, you're not allowed to go to the barber shop. Obviously, the Pennsylvania governor went crazy. So in a statement on behalf of the barber shop attorney, Mark Conan said the shop has been closed since Wolf's shutdown order, adding that the proprietor, Carlos Norman, and the quarterback are good friends. And Norman cut Roethlisberger's hair as a favor without payment. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but I got one pressing question for yes. you, Mark. Are you a fan of that type of music? <laughs> you know what? It does make you want to like get up. It does make you w- motivated. When yeah. you hear that music, yeah. it's like a very motivating beat to it. Um, wow, I'm surprised. Yeah. Usually when I talk to boomers about you know our our cultural music today, you guys get a little uptight. Well, oh, honest, that's not real music. Oh, man, the Who and the Rolling Stones. Yeah, but you know what? You it's know usually what, uh, the same story. Yeah, but your music, you know what your music is missing? The And I truly believe this, the lyrics. The lyrics are like completely idiots, complete idiots. Yeah, I think it depends on the artist. Right. I mean, like the, the artist who is in that... Um, as a that general, clip. as a general principle, most of the artists, I'm sure there are exceptions, obviously, but I think as a general principle, most of the artists, they say nothing, right? Yeah. However, in the 1970s, the music actually didn't just sound good because it was, you know, obviously rock, but also they had um, real lyrics that actually meant something. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, most of it was name poetry, an artist from poetry the 1970s. set to music. My Bob Dylan, probably the best exception. Absolutely. Sorry, the best so, instance of what we're talking about. But the answer to your question is, yeah, I actually like that. I like ah, the music. Fair yeah. enough. That's yeah. a, I was uh, unexpected, Mark. Yeah, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I would have chosen those lyrics, but I think it was pretty cool to shoot a video for, you know, Roethlisberger yeah. uh, getting back to practice for the first time. Call and, them hype tapes, Mark. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, well, yeah, it's... Actually, makes perfect sense. It's a hype tape. Yeah. So, in Maryland, podcast listeners, uh, there is a restaurant in Ocean City, Maryland, and it made national news, which is why we're talking about it, because we love to hit the national news stories, um, regardless of what state and what community. So, there's a restaurant in Ocean City, Maryland, which is a resort town in the ocean. Yeah. Um, beach community. Beach community, and it, of course, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. It's all about the bars, the descend tours, there and the restaurants. In the summertime, yep. in the springtime, in the fall. And naturally, since we're, you know, in warmer weather, people want to go there. And I would give a lot to be able to go on a bar, go to a bar right now, like a patio bar, sit and drink some beers outside, Mark. I miss it. Exactly. More than anything right now. So what's the restaurant there. called? Fish? Tales. Fish Tales. Fish Tales. Okay. okay. So Fish Tales in Ocean City, Maryland, decided that they wanted to open back up because the governor is allowing kind of a a slow open, particularly in the resort town, because how can you yeah. go to a resort town and not actually like go out do and things. do things? Yeah, Thank it's you. the whole economy. It <laughs> is really the whole economy. And so this particular restaurant has bumper tables. So bumper tables. It looks like uh, basically an inner tube that you would get into and go down a slide, maybe. <laughs> Instead, and it's a very large inner tube, it's like six inches in dia- six feet, excuse me, in diameter. And but in between the inner tube and you is a table, and then you stand in the middle of it, and it's elevated by legs, which are on wheels, so you can walk around with this. Um, we have a clip of this. There's no, um, there's really nothing to listen to as much as there is to see. I think it's kind of ingenious. We'll talk about this in a minute, and here's the clip. So they're walking around, obviously, and with cocktails in hand because it's perfectly safe. <laughs> Meanwhile, the cocktail's almost spilling the entire time all over the table. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just want to know, how do they go to the bathroom? <laughs> you gotta get out of your tube. <laughs> how does that fit in the door? Mark, when we talk about innovation... <laughs> <laughs> assistant, <laughs> assistant producer Chris, Christopher Hopkins had a solution, but we're not going to describe it at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> a little inappropriate. <laughs> uh, Mark, when we talk about innovation on this show, this is exactly what you and I have in mind. Yes, this, this is, is American this innovation. This is it. How do we solve the problem? Bumper tables. <laughs> That's right. We're not going to be banned from having a beer. We're going we're gonna to wear bumper tables. It's perfect. 
Perfect. I honestly, I want to just start bumper cars with my bumper table. You know, to start, <laughs> you know, I have a giant bar mosh pit with my bar tables. <laughs> so one of the questions I have is, and apparently others did too, in the feed of the YouTube uh, post was, well. How do you clean those? Because clearly people are spilling beer all over them because they're very unstable anyway. Well, luckily people are for walking you, around. alcohol is a natural disinfectant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's perfectly safe. <laughs> so I guess they have to hose them down and then probably. wash them with probably mops and all that stuff. And then you start all over again. I guess it's, I don't <laughs> yeah. know. You always take a risk. And that's what we always say. Whenever yeah, there you is no perfect solution. There is nothing <laughs> that is going to make sure you don't get sick. But I like you said, this is innovation. This is innovation at <laughs> its <laughs> finest. <laughs> This is as good as it gets. We have peaked as society right here. I will not be denied a beer. I will not be denied on vacation to go out and have a good I time. Will, I will wear this bumper table with pride. Exactly. You don't allow bumper tables in this restaurant? I brought my own. <laughs> oh, I really, I want to talk to the person whose idea it was. It's just like, I, how do I, uh, bumper tables, man. Well, you know, in every county you have a health department. And the health department comes in to, of course, approve your, oh, yeah. your protocols as a restaurant. So I think it's really funny. Your bumper tables need to be two inches wider in diameter. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> because the health department guy is going, well, at what point do they actually get out of the bumper table and go to the restroom? And then what happens after that? I just want to know. <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess they were approved by the health department and now they're open with these bumper tables. Good for you. Good for Fish you. tails in Ocean City, Maryland. Great Innovative, job. Innovative, unique, awesome, fun. Absolutely. Great times. So we love other podcasts. Obviously, Joe Rogan is one of the podcast greats in America right now. And his podcast is, of course, was already growing for many, many years. However, his podcast has been exploding during the pandemic because people, of course, don't have a whole lot to do and they have more opportunity to listen and watch his podcast. Um, he is concerned, and so are we, about YouTube and YouTube's ability to censor what you put up. Yes, um, and, uh, and they do we, it uniquely, too. They don't just like outright take your clip down. What they'll, they'll do is they'll leave it up and they'll just demonetize it. They'll and demonetize it. Explain times, what that means, demonetize. Oh, so, you know, a lot of times YouTube plays ads or calculates how much money you deserve based on viewership and things like that. And what they'll do is they'll just put a little mark on your video and say you can't make money off of it. And so any advertisement that's shown on it, Anything. Well, actually, they, a lot of times they they'll pull the advertisement. It's your, it's your YouTube they that have you put together and a produced. a very broad community guideline rule set that is not very specific. So they're legally stealing, first of all. Sure. I they're mean, stealing. In some ways, you can make that argument. Um, and I think you, know, you probably have a lot of credence to it, too. Um, and if they don't like your message, they'll just downright take it down. They won't just demonetize it. They'll take it down. Yeah, they'll, they'll strike it down. They'll give you, or they'll demonetize it for minor infractions. It's, it's really interesting the way that they do it because for a lot of people, they feel like there's not a lot of rhyme or reason for it. Which I, I just can't believe that. And Joe Rogan has signed a $100 million, million dollar deal. deal with Spotify. Holy cow, Mark. So Spotify is guaranteeing him $100 million over a pretty darn short period of time. And Joe Rogan is 52 years old. And uh, this is what the article says in the Wall Street Journal. Had so far withheld his podcast from Spotify. He wouldn't allow them to broadcast it at all because it's up to him. It's his podcast saying the streaming service doesn't pay enough. And he had been generating significant revenue on other services such as Alphabet Inc.'s YouTube. Yeah. His full library dating back 11 years is to hit Spotify service beginning September 1. And Spotify will be the exclusive broadcaster of Joe Rogan's podcast beginning then. And you will no longer be able to see not just his new uh, podcast on, on on YouTube, but you won't be able to see any of the 11 years on YouTube. He's completely transferring All out the, of YouTube. Oh, no kidding. So I mean, that's a good way to stick it to him. I mean, you know, he's one of the most watched YouTubers, one of the biggest channels on YouTube. You know, I, I think this in, embodies all the free market principles that we talk about pretty regularly. And that's if you don't like something, shop around. Find I think something he, that works for you. I agree. And I think he wants to be more free in what he says. Yeah. Because, because he you does talk last... a lot of, about a lot of very, I'm not going to say they're touchy topics, but he talks about a lot of things outside of the mainstream or, t or he is willing to have opinions on his show that aren't politically correct. Aren't millennials uh, really, aren't they big fans of, for I the most part, Joe Rogan. Joe, There you go. I love I mean, him. A lot of people love him. I know, uh, you know. Adam Couture, our producer, he loves Joe Rogan. Yeah. Um, my son loves Joe Rogan. 
And, but what I've noticed is that for the past couple of months, Joe Rogan has been saying things such as, you know, if Joe Biden is the nominee for the Democrat party. I might vote for Trump. I might have to vote for Trump. Yeah. And he was having that conversation with a number of b- different people, including uh, Tesla's Elon Musk. Yes. And I gotta think that because Joe Rogan is so, um, basically, he, he your generation loves him because he's so influential that YouTube might decide to pull down some of those podcasts off of their channel. And I think he's concerned about that. I'm not saying he said anything about it, but right. if I were Joe Rogan, I'd sure be concerned. I also think it's 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 a lot of other things too. I mean, he talks about some like historically significant topics. He talks about a lot of cultural news and things like that. And he has a lot of people on who do a lot of research into topics that people might not be comfortable discussing. Like I know one of the ones that he was concerned about. He's a critical thinker, though. He's isn't a critical he? thinker. One of the ones he was who was talking about that got a lot of um, weird press was so he had a lady on who wrote a book about Operation Paperclip. And if you're not familiar with what Operation Paperclip was, it was in the aftermath, no. of, aftermath of World War II. Um, the U.S. and the Soviets had this giant race to pick up Nazi scientists and bring them to their own countries for their own, you know, educational benefit. And the U.S. didn't know that we, the public didn't know that the U.S. did this for the better part of 40 or 50 years. I mean, if you look at Warner von Braun, the person who put man on the moon for the United States, he was a Nazi scientist. And we brought him over as part of this paper, uh, this operation. And he had a whole two-hour segment just asking this lady questions about this. And, and to a lot of people, it was it was uncomfortable discussing, you know, Nazis on a podcast. And, and so, like, th- these kinds of conversations... Um, free speech. I think, while yes, they embody free speech. Places like YouTube, for ad purposes, get uncomfortable, you know, putting these ads on topics like this, and so they'll, you know, demonetize or do whatever they because can they do. can because they can, and they they they. And YouTube I think the move like this, to, they get to decide solely yeah. on their own whether you get to be monetized or yep. not in any given podcast, and they also get to decide whether they just don't want you to see it. Yeah, and, and I think a move like this allows people, and it doesn't have to be Spotify, like if you have a podcast or a show or anything and you are uncomfortable with the guidelines and parameters YouTube sets on you and what you view as a lack of accountability, because you can appeal these things. They don't just indefinitely like drop the band hammer on you and call it a day. What they'll do is they'll just say, you know, if you would like to appeal, please appeal. And then you appeal and you never really get an answer. I mean... No, you know, because I've done that before. Yeah. I've appealed before and no one actually gets back to you because they don't, they don't care. care. Yeah. Because it's, by the way, it used to matter more that they didn't care because it was YouTube and nobody else. But now you have Spotify. Yeah, you have now you have I- iTunes. iTunes. And of course, Apple and iTunes is, is exclusively listening. But, I, but obviously, Apple is... And has developed its own video service as well. So very, you know, very soon yeah. you're going to be able to be able to see, not just listen yeah. to a podcast. I think a move like this, this already. Yeah, and, and there's so many more options out there. And it's one of the benefits of living in, in a capitalist society where if you have an idea, other people can have a similar idea, and you can do it. And this move ensures, I think, from Joe's perspective, and I think, you know. If he wants to put out the content he wants, he doesn't have to worry about you know adhering to some guidelines he's not sure about. He can be authentic. He can have authentic conversations. But doesn't your generation, the millennials, don't don't the millennials generally go to YouTube first anyway? Isn't that kind of like the go-to for millennials? I mean, I feel like it is for boomers. I think it is one part of a larger whole. Um, I to some people it might be the first place they go. Um, me, I know the show. And then I want to go find it wherever I can find it. Right. And so, like, you okay. know, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Like, I, I personally have a Spotify account. I like mm-hmm. Spotify better than iTunes. And so I first, if I want to go see a podcast or if I want to listen to something, I generally go find it on Spotify first. Sure. Um, but if I can't find it on Spotify or if I want to see the video attached, I go to YouTube. YouTube. But that's I, the key. But that's the key is the video, which is, I think, where places like Spotify and Apple are going to So that's where I'm confused. So... Clarify this for me. If he's moving exclusively to Spotify, how are you gonna, you're obviously gonna be able to listen to him. How do yeah. you see? Because I, I, I know with my son, my son enjoys actually watching, watching Joe Rogan, yeah. not just listening. Whereas there's some podcasts you really don't care whether you see them or not. You yeah. actually just wanna listen. One like ours, though, you, you wanna watch the clips. There's a lot to do it that way. And then you wanna watch them. And it's imperative. And we know to your watch mother them. likes to watch you and give you a hard time. <laughs> uh, so. yeah. But we're not gonna go there. Hi, mom. <laughs> She's been on Hi, me. Hi, Derek's her, mom. She's been on, on me for a shout out. So <laughs> here how, it is. How are people going to see uh, Joe Rogan on Spotify? 
How does That's that a good question. I think there's two ways that this can happen. I don't know um, what they're going to do, but he can either, you know, presumably move them all the clips and videos to his website, or Spotify can innovate. And Spotify can Which make, I think they're going to do. I think I think it's the best way for them yes. to go is to incorporate some kind of video. And go head to head with YouTube. And go, yeah. Just start, do it, man. When you make a big move, like you being in one of the world's biggest podcasters, you got to go, you got to keep going. You got to be pushing the boundaries. And, and let think, whatever is said be said. Yeah. Stop, you know, stop being, I, it's, this is what we need. We need more companies like Spotify and more companies like iTunes who just let you say what you want to say because it's a free country. Yeah. And not... Less companies, of course, like YouTube and Alphabet and Google, which decide on their own accord to just demonetize you, as you described earlier, yeah. or just pull your video down and yeah. say, it's not, the video is no longer available. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's well within Alphabet and Google and YouTube's right to do what they want, but, you know, there are consequences, and these are the ones you see in a free market where people compare what they're presented and they pick the best option for them. Exactly. Yep. So, get this, so Joe Rogan, is likely, the deal is likely worth $100 million based on certain milestones and performance metrics according to people familiar with the deal. So congratulations to Joe Rogan. That is freaking awesome. Joe Rogan Absolutely is one very rich awesome. man. Yes, <laughs> if he's not already, I'm pretty sure he is already. Wouldn't even doubt it. Absolutely. So next up, we have the dumbest bill in America. It's the dumbest bill in America. Do we have a lead up to this, Mr. Assistant Producer? Yep. And here it is. So the dumbest bill in America is, it's the Oregon Motor Voter Law. And why do you suppose this is a dumb bill? And what is a motor voter law? Garrick. Isn't a motor voter, isn't that you go into the DMV and they auto registrate? They automatically register you to vote when you go to register your car or renew your driver's license or renew the registration to any of your cars or car. Interesting. Yes, so why does this matter? Why does this matter? Because there is confusion in the state of Oregon because the motor voter law, which was passed a number of years ago, uh, and has been implemented little by little, and now it's fully implemented here in 2020, uh, suppose, supposedly automatically registers people to vote who visit the DMV, the Department of Motor, Co Motor Vehicles. Interesting. But by default, they are registered as a non-affiliated voter. So they're not registered as a party oh, member. and they probably have a closed primary. So they have a closed primary. Yes. So what is a closed primary? It means that you have to be a registered member of either the Democrat or Republican Party in order to cast a ballot in their primary. Exactly. So you have to be registered in either party in order to vote in that party's primary. You can't be unaffiliated or non-affiliated. And so what they've done in Oregon is say that as long as you have a car, you are automatically registered to vote. And if you do not determine the party that you are wanting to affiliate with, they're going to put you as an unaffiliated voter. Hmm. And so what has happened is when you go to have your license renewed or when you have your car registration renewed, you already had your license, you're just renewing it. You already had your registration, just renewing it. If you don't, if you don't basically say to the motor voter folks, I want to be registered as a Democrat or a Republican, even though you had been registered already as either party for years and years, guess what they're doing? They're automatically throwing you in the unaffiliated category. And so there are all kinds of issues where hundreds and hundreds of Republican ballots have been issued as nonpartisan ballots, thus denying the GOP the ability to vote in a primary in several really hotly contested primaries in the state of Oregon. No kidding. All intentional. That's, uh... So it's voter suppression by a law that was passed, of course, by the woke Democrats in Oregon. My view on voter registration, if you want to be a registered voter, you should be able to just register on your own accord. I, yes. don't, I don't really think that... You have a civic, respons civic responsibility? Yeah, I don't think it's really necessary that every time you show up to a government office to do some kind of government business that they're like, oh, by the way, while we're here, we're going to register you to vote. You know, when I turned 18, the first thing I did was I went over to the um, Department of Elections in New Jersey and I filled out my voter registration yes. card and I got it two weeks later in the mail and I got a primary ballot a couple months later. Yes, and by the way, in Oregon, in Oregon, you don't have a choice. You are automatically opted in. 
And yeah. so in order to not be registered to vote, by the way, there are some folks who don't like to vote. Oh, God, they, no. For whatever reason. My they generation, just young people, we do not vote. And they also don't want to be registered. Why don't they want to be registered? Because Skepticism they don't want the, the government, government to have information as to what they're thinking and how they want yeah. to register. Skepticism. They just want to be left alone. Yeah. So therefore, they don't want to have to register to vote. But not in Oregon. In Oregon, you have to affirmatively opt out. <laughs> and you're automatically opted in as a non-affiliated voter, which means you can't even vote anyway in the I, primary. I hate those opt-out, like people, <laughs> the opt-out systems. You see it in a lot of different like legislative initiatives where they'll like crunch you into a program and then you have to opt out and it causes so many headaches because you, know, you try to opt out and they're like, well, you should probably stay in and they just try to keep you in as long as you can and they don't. They don't readily respond to you. It's you know, it's interesting. Is we had a we had a law in <laughs> we had a law back east, uh, and the law was um, to that when you went to register your car or you went to get your driver's license, that you are affirmatively going to be a, an organ donor. And oh boy! It was a law that ultimately a bill that ultimately did not pass to become a law. Um, but nonetheless, there was a member of the House of Delegates that actually tried to pass this bill. So imagine. You go to the the M, the MVA, the Motor Vehicles Department of Motor Vehicle Vehicles. And the first thing they said to you is, um, "Hey, you're a do- you're a donor, unless you don't want to be a donor." But if the person who's taking care of you at the desk doesn't tell you that, then yeah. the computer automatically says you're a donor. So when you get into a car accident, you know, good luck. All your you all your organs always, are gonna be harvested. You should always just be presented the choice, and if you don't do it, you don't do it. I hate when it's. You're doing it, and if you don't want to, then we'll opt you out. Right. But we're doing it. <laughs> Whatever happens, free things, choice. Yeah, like just free choice, especially things like organ donations. Like there's a lot of religious implications there and a lot of different you know, reasons people don't want to be an organ donor. And I personally, like I am an organ donor. It doesn't bother me. But, you know, I had the choice. When I went to the DMV, there was a piece of paper, and it said, do you want to be an organ donor? If yes, check yes. If no, then no. If And it was like below, it says, if you, don't, if you leave the section blank, it'll be considered a no. Like that is probably how it should always be done. But I like, you know, a lot of this legislation, it gets put into place because it thinks it's, you know, helping people or doing things properly. I don't think there's an issue with voter registration where people just don't know how to register or can't register. It's probably easier now today than at any other time in history. All you do is pull up a web page at your local state government, you know, election commission and you type you in. You print it out or you can print it out. You can fill it and out. And mail it in. And you mail it in along with the uh, basically other copies of documents to yeah. determine that you really are indeed Most a resident of them, you can just scan area. them, you can scan them and upload them through the computer and then you can just hit submit on and the computer. And they can tell, of course, if you're truly a resident, if they really want to affirm that you're not just a resident, but also a citizen. Yeah. But in Oregon, of course, you know, they've decided that they wanted to pass this bill and, and here's the fit, here's the thing for folks out there in podcast land. We're not saying that it's a bad idea to want to register more people. We're saying it's a really bad idea to tell people how they're going to be affiliated yeah. and not give them an opportunity to just say, look, I'm going to register when I'm ready to, and when I decide to affiliate, I'm going to affiliate. I don't need you to do that for me without even asking me. Yeah, it wouldn't be hard to, while you're at the DMV, just have a form on the side and say, hey, do you want to register to vote today? Here's a form to do it. Exactly. There's definitely a better way, and each state gets to decide its own, but Oregon, of course, they've literally decided in a bill that they passed years ago that's now finally in full implementation, what they've decided now is the bill is going to enfranchise more people. Instead, it is actually there's, disenfranchised there's also, people. There's also some a nuisance implications to a bill like this. As somebody who's done uh, campaigns for fun in the side, like, you know, assisted with them, uh, a lot of candidates go and they get the voter file for the state and it has the list of everybody who's registered to vote. And do you know what that means? You get targeted ads, you get mailers, you get all these things that you didn't want to be a party to because you were thrown onto the voter rolls. That's exactly right. However you want it to be. And that's the final word for Mark and the Millennials. Thank you for joining Mark and the Millennials. And this is Mark Fisher. Thank you to our millennial, Garrick Ross, and of course, our producer, Adam Katora, and our assistant producer, Christopher Hopkins. Check us out on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and our website. See you next time.